and fibromyalgic pain. Pain occurs in the body when the body becomes acid. If you've got a urine that is light yellow, urine should be actually colorless, almost colorless, but up to light yellow is acceptable. But when it becomes orange, then your body is getting acid. You need a pH of 7.3 to 7.1 in the blood and 7.4 in the, in the, inside the cells. When you alter this by dehydration, not drinking enough water to wash the acid out of the body, and the interior of the cells become uh, acidic, you don't have enough sodium to take the acidity out of the cell, then you build up the acid, which damages the DNA. So this is a primary problem. But before this occurs, acid converts pre-calicrine to kinin inside the cells. Kinin is a pain producer. When the body becomes acid, you produce more kinins in the cells. Nerve endings in the environment where you have high acidity register this chemical environmental change with the brain, and the brain registers it with our conscious mind in form of pain, meaning pain is a sign of high acidity when there hasn't been enough water in circulation to wash the toxic waste away. That's why pain is a limiting factor. It's telling us don't create more acid, go and drink water, let it circulate, let it wash the toxic waste out of the environment, and then once the pain subsides, then it means that your body is okay, you can use it. This is what pain means, high acidity in the body. This is the alkaline level. When the body becomes more and more acid, the interior of the cells become acid, and some of these may be nerve endings, and they register this with the brain in form of pain. And the brain translates the information for the conscious mind in form of pain. There are two components to pain. One is the pain that is, can be dealt with locally. When you take uh, one of these painkillers, you prevent prostaglandin and kinin formation, which are the pain-producing elements that are subordinate to histamine. But there is also a central nervous system pain that directly signals pain, and these painkillers cannot get at the central nervous system pain. That's what happened to the guy that I treated after 10 hours of pain with water when none of these pain medications had worked on him. He was suffering from his central nervous system mechanism of pain production. That's why a lot of these people who are on painkillers gradually become uh, less sensitive to the medication, and that's why the doctor has to change and change and change, but never work. And there are 110 million Americans who suffer from pain of one kind or another, and uh, they don't realize that they, are, they have been dehydrated all this time. Painkillers cut the connection between prostaglandin and kinin, a platelet activating factor. And uh, these, this is a water regulator, but it also regulates completion of cell maturity. So dehydration plus painkillers makes the body susceptible to cancer cell formations producing immature cells. Long-term use of painkillers is dangerous. Anginal pain, even though the heart circulates all the blood, nonetheless, the heart muscle itself could become dehydrated to the point of producing pain. But the mechanism is a little more complicated than that. When we eat and we don't drink enough water, gastrointestinal tract deals with the situation, borrows water from here and there to the best of its ability and produces a concentrated form of uh, digestive juices that enter the, the blood, uh, di digestive products that enter the blood and go to the liver, and the liver pumps it uh, eventually through the portal circulation to the right side of the heart, and, uh, and the heart pumps it into the lung tissue. And the lung tissue, because of its nature, will absorb a little more uh, water that's not there and makes, makes the blood even more concentrated. 
but the lung tissue in the process is now beginning to sense dehydration and is producing constrictive chemicals. These constrictive chemicals, if they spill over into the circulation and go to the left side of the heart, they will have exactly the same impact on the vascular system of the heart and produce a spasm of the, of the coronary artery. And this, in my opinion, is the cause of pain. That is the cause of anginal pain. But also, this concentrated blood will begin to draw a lot of water out of the membrane uh, cells. And because of its nature of rushing and uh, pumping action, and the abrasive action of concentrated blood and acidic blood, blood that's damaging the tissue, circulation in the coronary arteries becomes hazardous to the membrane because it produces tiny abrasions and tears. And unless something covers up these abrasions and tears, what, uh, the blood will find a lip in one of these tears and peel the membrane off and throw it as an embolus. So the design of the body is such that cholesterol is designed to come and cover up that abrasion straight away and smoothen over it. It makes it waterproof so that no more water will be lost uh, to the blood. And, uh, and, and this low-density cholesterol that does this is actually saving your life. There is no such thing as bad cholesterol. The body does not make bad cholesterol or bad elements that's hazardous to its own survival. The medical community doesn't understand this and buys into the slogan of bad cholesterol and the pharmaceutical industry's uh, fraudulent uh, use of society as cash cows for its products is pushing the use of cholesterol-lowering medications. They fail to explain to the society that we measure the level of cholesterol in the body in the blood that we take out of the veins of the body. And nowhere in the history of medicine is there a record of cholesterol ever having blocked the veins of the body. So if this bad material was going to spill over and stick to the walls and block the system, it should do so more readily in the veins because the vein flow is a float mechanism. It flows upwards. It's not, it, it's not pumped. And in this situation, the cholesterol would be able to stick to the wall more readily, but it doesn't. So that is not the function of cholesterol. Cholesterol is saving our lives by being the grease gauze, the adhesive bandage that sticks to the tears and wears and tears of the arterial system that are produced by concentrated acidic blood that rushes through these elements. So beware, cholesterol-lowering medications are dangerous. They are not helping you. Uh, they're, in fact, causing a lot of liver damage. A lot of people are now suffering from liver problems as a result of buying into the idea that cholesterol-lowering medications are essential for